Thank you. So it's a, a huge honor for me to be here today. And uh, I want to begin uh, my talk this afternoon uh, with scripture because it's been a lifelong desire to keep coming time and time again to the scriptures to hear from God. And part of that is because of my upbringing. I was actually brought up in a Methodist home. My dad was a local preacher for 25 years. And, um, and so in a sense, with this lecture, I come from a Methodist background uh, through the charismatic renewal influenced hugely by Pentecostals, and as I go through my talk, I want to bring some personal testimony uh, and experience of uh, my life and the things I've been involved in uh, on my particular journey. But let me first start with a biblical uh, backdrop to what I want to share. Um, I begin with the person of the Holy Spirit. It's been my privilege to get to know the Holy Spirit, to recognize that the Holy Spirit is a person, um, that the Holy Spirit, as uh, shown in Scripture, uh, is not uh, a power or a force or some kind of influence, but a person who can be known. We would not, in fact, be Christians without the gracious work of the Holy Spirit. He convicted us of sin, made us a new creation in Christ. He implanted within us the seed of his divine nature, which grows into fruit as we allow him to make us more like Jesus. And so in Galatians chapter 5, we have the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit in a believer's life, uh, the character of Christ, if you like, being formed. The work of the Holy Spirit is to manifest, I believe, the active presence of God in his world, and especially working through his church, through the body of Christ. And um, throughout the scriptures, I believe, we find symbols and pictures of the Holy Spirit. And I find it very helpful when I think of the Holy Spirit to look at all the images, the pictures, the symbols of the Holy Spirit, which gives this rich variety of color and presence and the way that the Holy Spirit works uh, today. And so not only, I believe, are these symbols of the Spirit in the scriptures just so that we can analyze the truth in some kind of objective way, but also in a subjective way whereby these images can actually penetrate our thinking and can penetrate our lives. For example, when we talk of the Holy Spirit as rain, the purpose isn't that we can say, oh, the Holy Spirit is like rain. The purpose is that we get refreshed, that we get wet, if you like. It's almost as though we can experience the, the person of the Holy Spirit very directly. And it's been my privilege to walk, uh, getting an understanding of the Holy Spirit um, being close as a person. And so let me just very quickly go through a few of the pictures that we do find uh, in the scriptures uh, with regard to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, for instance, in the scriptures comes as rain. This is a picture of the refreshing work of God. We can find him refreshing people, refreshing situations, coming into uh, bleak situations and things begin to live again. In Joel 2, verses 23 to 29, there's that imagery of the autumn and spring rains, of the poured out water, if you like. In Isaiah 28, we find a picture of restoration, things that were lost being found. Verse 11, it says, this is the resting place. Let the weary rest. I love this imagery of the rain that refreshes and blesses and brings things, things to order. And indeed, at Pentecost, the imagery is the pouring out, the pouring out picture of latter rain, which brings harvest and refreshment. And so we see the Holy Spirit as rain. Also, we see the Holy Spirit, of course, as dew. Both of these images are very beautiful. In Psalm 133, which I think is my favorite psalm, we find that the unity that Christ brings to the church, two pictures and images are used that I believe are images of the Holy Spirit, Oil and dew. And the dew, like the dew of Hermon coming onto the barren wastes of Zion, it's as though the Holy Spirit comes to a, a church that desperately needs refreshment. 
And so I love the imagery of the Holy Spirit coming as rain. We also find in the scriptures the Holy Spirit comes as rivers, uh, channels of refreshment, rivers of living water. That's an image that Jesus himself in John 7 verses 37 to 39 he talks about streams of living water will flow from within him. Out of the innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Speaking of the Holy Spirit, the river of God. Some of that imagery is used in songs and times of renewal and times of refreshment. Pick up this image of the river of God. And also we find the 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 almost the opposite picture, the, the sound of rushing wind, the power and the guidance of the Holy Spirit in Acts 2 and verse 3. Uh, the Holy Spirit comes as oil, one of those other pictures from Psalm 133, uh, picked up by Paul in 2 Corinthians 1 verse 21 and 22. He anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us, and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Picture of oil. Uh, throughout the Old Testament, of course, the anointing oil was used. The high priest, the uh, large amounts of oil poured on the head, going down the robe, uh, touching even the, 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 the feet of the, uh, the high priest. Uh, the picture of anointing. And often we use that phrase when the Holy Spirit is working. We get anointed with the Holy Spirit. Uh, Christ did. It's as though that personal God uh, touches our lives and we are impacted and empowered for service. The Holy Spirit comes as oil. The Holy Spirit is also seen in the scriptures as wine. Ephesians 5 verse 18, that that imagery again is picked up. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. The picture here of joy being brought. Again, this idea of refreshment and blessing. Uh, this joy has been referred by some as, and I love this, the sober intoxication of the Spirit. We don't get drunk with wine. We get drunk, if you like, with the Holy Spirit. A wonderful image of the joy of the Lord being our strength. Uh, so many various pictures being used that kind of give us a, a, a picture of the, the vast nature of how the Holy Spirit in wonderful ways works and moves in the earth and in uh, his church. The Holy Spirit also comes as a dove, that well-known symbol that we find in the New Testament, the symbol of peace. Matthew 3, verse 16, uh, it says, At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. But as we heard earlier, the, these images are not just refreshment images and blessing images and peace images. Um, one of Samuel Chadwick's favorite um, symbols was the Holy Spirit comes as fire. This picture of purity, purifying, of power. Again, the sound of a mighty rushing wind. Acts 2 verse 3, tongues of fire coming and settling on the believers. The refueling of the church, the purifying of the church. That kind of picture is reminiscent of the burning bush of Exodus 3, 2, where Moses is confronted with God and again here, this imagery moves throughout the scriptures and into the New Testament, becomes a symbol of the powerful work of the Holy Spirit. And it's that for a minute or two I want us to think about, because Samuel Chadwick often made reference to fire. He spoke of the spirit-filled soul being ablaze for God. Those, those pictures of fire being ablaze, it's to do with passion, it's to do with energy, it's to do with living, vital relationship with God. He writes this, The one vital need is fire. Without the flame and fervor of the Holy Ghost, the church will never accomplish its mission. 
And so Samuel Chadwick makes that move from a knowledge of the Scriptures and a knowledge of the Holy Spirit to a personal walk with God that then ultimately works out into mission. Uh, and this quote from the, the Way to Pentecost, a uh, little booklet I got out, um, dusted down the other day and had a read again, uh, makes that link between personal experience and the wider mission of the church. And so the Holy Spirit uh, was sent for purpose, sent uh, into our world, uh, sent into the church, into our, us as believers, working throughout the world. And this, for me, is outlined by the words of Jesus in Acts 1 and verse 4. The purpose, the reason, the sending. Jesus says, don't leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. Then verse 5 says, For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Well, some years ago I went on this kind of journey, looking into scriptures, trying to discern things about the working of the Holy Spirit, and um, I, it was some of this that started to get me into some measure of trouble, historically, which I'll come on to in a minute or two. But throughout the Acts of the Apostles, there are interchangeable terms, I believe, that seem to be used with regard to this kind of empowerment. Let me just read that again. The one vital need is fire. Without the flame and fervor of the Holy Ghost, the church will never accomplish its mission. And so the, uh, p the person of the Holy Spirit, um, the, the working of the Holy Spirit is expressed in many interchangeable ways uh, within the New Testament. We find, for instance, in Acts 1 uh, and Acts 11, uh, the, the term baptized, being baptized in the Holy Spirit. Acts 1 verse 4, receiving a promise, the promise of the Father. Acts 8, receiving a gift, the gift of the Holy Spirit. Acts 1 verse 8, receiving power to witness. Acts 2 verse 4, being filled with the Holy Spirit. And I remember historically all kinds of discussions on how we could adequately talk about how an individual believer could be empowered. What was it like? How did it work? And so on. And having the Holy Spirit uh, come upon people, fill them. Uh, how do we describe this? The pouring out of the Holy Spirit, etc. And this empowerment, which Jesus spoke of in Luke 24, verse 49, I believe is essential for individual followers of Jesus and for the church. For verse 49 says, I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. And verse uh, 49 uh, says, um, sorry, I'm getting a little bit behind my notes. Um, I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. I, I find for a fuller uh, looking into this uh, personal working of the Holy Spirit, can I just recommend one book at this point, which is um, a study on Romans chapter 8. It's a fairly old book by Dr. Skevington Wood that looks into, uh, just from in one chapter, uh, the moving, the working of the Holy Spirit uh, in that chapter is very important and a good book to read. And of course, uh, I wouldn't be a charismatic if I didn't just mention that in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, of course, the necessity for the gifts of the Holy Spirit to be operating uh, in the church uh, today. So that's just a, a very brief uh, outline of, of some uh, biblical truth. But I'd love to just move on now to my personal story and testimony. 
As I said earlier, I was brought up in a Methodist home. My dad was a Methodist local preacher for years, and I had the privilege of going with him, often on a Sunday evening when he was going around rural Lincolnshire. It shows how long ago this was. Uh, I would go on the crossbar of my bi dad's bike uh, to little rural chapels uh, across Lincolnshire. And I remember, with some fondness, uh, a Sunday evening, you'd, we would always get there early because my dad would say, if you're 10 minutes early, you're late. So we were always there nice and early. And um, then uh, uh, an elderly lady would arrive on a bike. I'm caricaturing it a bit, but this was the kind of image I had as a young boy. And uh, she would have a, a, a large bunch of keys and o open the door. And then on a good, a good evening, there would perhaps be eight or 10 elderly people. And the same lady would play what I would describe as a kind of a demonized um, uh, musical instrument. Some of you will remember uh, an instrument known as the harmonium, where she would sit down and start to pedal. And, uh, and we would start briskly with uh, a Methodist hymn, Charles Wesley hymn, I would guess. But often with those hymns, there were many verses, which meant by verse four or five, we were radically slowing down as we're trying to sing the hymn. And, and so I've got memories of rural Lincolnshire, Methodism, lots of good people, sincere, but an aging group of people. And I remember as a boy thinking, you know, I'm not sure there's much hope for the future. And it was that little seed sown in me where I knew having been brought up with scripture, in fact, my parents bought me a Bible, I remember being disappointed one Christmas morning because I got a Bible before I could read and it was the authorized version. I, that's lodged in my mind somewhere. They wanted the Bible to be in me and I've still got that Bible and it's written in there by my mom and dad and their hopes and aspirations for me. But I was brought up on scripture and I read the scriptural, uh, the, the stories of early church and somehow it seemed as though we were a million miles away from what I was reading. And just as a young boy, I started to ask questions uh, about those things. And so I thought perhaps the best way we could do it is liven up services. And so it was in the days of the Beatles, so four of us bought guitars and we started to go around uh, little chapels and um, we thought, if you liven the music up, we'll attract more people. Little did I know that that wasn't too well received. And so we found ourselves being pushed out of the walls of chapels and so on. Uh, but we started to be welcomed within schools and concerts and prisons. And, and I would say that in those days, we were kind of experimentally beginning to move into what, I, what is now being known as fresh expressions. Uh, we didn't have a language for it. I'd never heard the words church planting, but it wasn't long before we recognized that the message that we were carrying in music and so on, and we, we went to the dizzy heights of becoming evangelists with British Youth for Christ, but when we went out, we found that people were responding, wanting to find faith. People were coming to know Christ, but there was a bridge that they wouldn't easily cross, and they wouldn't cross into the life of the church. And so um, we had a, a set of concerts in schools in the city where we live in Lincoln, and went into all the secondary schools. And as a result of that, around 30 young people decided that they wanted to follow Christ. And so we naively invited them to our church uh, chapel on Sunday morning, um, and about half of them came to our surprise. About 15 of these people, young people came. But the inevitable happened. Two things happened, actually. The, the people in the chapel weren't too pleased to receive this group because they didn't know how to behave and they were chattering and talking. And the second thing was that these young people uh, didn't identify with the, the service. And so straight afterwards they said, we, we, we enjoyed what you brought in the week, but there's no way that we can uh, get involved in church life. And so, uh, we, very quickly, I went to the Methodist ministry. Is there any way that we can do something about this? Um, and uh, the Methodist minister was very helpful at the time. 
and uh, allowed us to use the minister's vestry on a Monday evening for a small uh, class, a discipleship group with these new believers, which we thought was a great idea. And um, the problem was uh, the, the uh, minister's vestry at the time was damp and smelt of gas. And so it wasn't totally conducive to a discipleship experience. And again, with the full permission of the Methodist minister, we were given permission to have a meeting in our home on a Friday evening. I just want to say we'd never heard of church planting, no desire to do anything different, wanted to remain within the Methodist church. There was nothing in us that was even understanding anything really about the concept of planting something new. But what happened was they started to come on Friday evenings and they didn't know the church was not meant to grow and so they started to bring friends and more and more young people turned up. And in a very short period of time, we were getting so many young people coming that we literally had to knock a wall down in our home. There was a builder across the, the way. We knocked the wall down, getting all these young people into our home. Now at that point, I thought the church would be happy and of course, as you look back in history, we didn't do things uh, as well as we should have, but I honestly believe that we stumbled upon, so I, I would say I planted, a, we and a little group of us, we planted a church really by accident in that first encounter. But it started to grow. And we knew that we must not just be an independent group, so we got help of uh, some ministers in the, in the town actually from a number of denominations who saw what was happening and helped us and stood with us. But that group grew, and they were not transfers from other churches, they were brand new believers. We had a great joy for perhaps a seven year period, seeing up to 120 or so young people come to faith, they were thriving and they were being blessed. And, um, and we suddenly realized that that new things had to happen in order to accommodate what the Holy Spirit was wanting to do. And this is almost 40 years ago, so you can imagine the picture then. And so growing up through the 60s and 70s, I would say, actually, I'd heard very little about the Holy Spirit. Some might have said that the Holy Spirit seemed to be the misplaced person of the Trinity. We'd heard about the Father, the Son, and I'd been brought up on the Holy Scriptures, but I'd not heard too much about the Holy Spirit. And so it's through those years that uh, there was a quest to know something of God's power, to believe that God could transform lives today. And uh, it was during that period as we got involved in evangelism that we came across some Pentecostals who, I have to say, frightened me somewhat at first. And I heard about the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And in those days, it was very controversial to hear about the speaking in tongues. But during this season, the charismatic movement began to spread across all the strands of the church and around our area. And for me, it was this empowerment and personal encounter with the person of the Holy Spirit that changed my life and the direction that I needed to go. And as such, I got involved in evangelism and, uh, and there were people around me that were interested in Jesus, but they couldn't make the move into the church easily. Around that time, there was a Methodist minister in our circuit who influenced change with a new, change with a new sense of life and growth. And uh, across the world, we began to see a moving of the Holy Spirit. In fact, it was a privilege of mine to go to the city of Pittsburgh some time ago, and it was there that I heard about the, the beginnings of the uh, Catholic charismatic movement. I passed a university known as Duquesne University, where the, the story goes that Cardinal Soonan's uh, got a number of priests together for a weekend and they took two books to that weekend. The first was The Cross and the Switchblade, a story of the radical conversion of someone involved in, in crime, a gang member of the Mau Maus in New York. And the second book was the book of the Acts of the Apostles. And I thought, well, what wisdom to take those two books, because what was being said was this, is there a God that is able to transform lives today? Can the hardest of criminals be transformed and changed by the work of the Spirit? 
and also, of course, the Acts of the Apostles, the story of how God had worked in the early church. And it was this that led me to a study of the Acts of the Apostles, led me to a new understanding of the power of the Spirit and also of the mission of the church. And for the last 40 years, this has led a number of us on a journey. It's led to the planting of a relatively large multi-site church in, based in Lincoln and a network of towards 90 churches in the UK. And I really identify with this comment by Samuel Chadwick. He writes this, I owe everything to the gift of Pentecost. For 50 days, the facts of the gospel were complete, but no conversions were recorded. Pentecost registered 3,000 souls. It is by fire that a holy passion is kindled in the soul whereby we live the life of God. For Samuel Chadwick, it was this personal Holy Spirit. It was the encounter of fire that led him uh, into the passion for mission. And my experience was that growth and life began to happen as we discovered the power and presence of the Holy Spirit, that we could know him, that we could see him actively working, that genuinely signs and wonders could accompany the proclamation of the word of God. I, find my, I found myself in what was first called the house church movement and later became the new church movement and now, of course, it's not new at all. But we began to experience uh, new things. We experimented with new models and new expressions and now I find myself, if I'm not careful, being defensive with new things that are coming, uh, new expressions, and again, I believe this has to be a, a life commitment to be ready and open to the next move of the Holy Spirit because I think in church history, often when there is a fresh move of the Holy Spirit, it's the last move that often speaks against uh, the current move of the Holy Spirit and I would never ever want to do that. A key house church leader, uh, Gerald Coates, in 1987 wrote these words. Those in leadership should be providing a helpful environment for individuals to pray, speak in tongues and interpret, heal the sick and cast out demons. He wrote that in a book, He Gives Signs. These were radical words 40 years ago. For me, this directive was getting closer to the early church narrative and therefore helped me to keep moving forward even though there were some painful experiences in doing so. It still remains my conviction that church, the church of Jesus, needs power and often requires new wineskins. We were excited by the possibility of more church planting. Perhaps today we use less provocative terms like fresh expressions of church uh, and a little bit more about that uh, a little later. So that's a little bit of my story, but I uh, conclude what I want to share with missional advancement. Uh, I do believe it could be argued, and I think rightly so, that in some parts of the new church movement, emphasis was strongly placed on experience. It was to do with me and me getting blessed and me receiving gifts, and it was very personalized. Meetings became more energized, the structures became more creative, but emphasis grew inward. As some became, I believe, self-seeking and maybe were seeing themselves as elitist, uh, as being higher or better or whatever. Others pulled away from traditional values and orthodox faith. It is my firm belief that Holy Spirit anointing is for missional advancement. Acts shows us the movement from the Lord adding to the church to a multiplication model. This is the thing we are looking into today. How can we see things multiply, not just within the church, but within all spheres of society, as the gospel again is able to take root in our land? I'm looking for the re-evangelizing of the UK. There are five statements that I can find uh, concerning how the church rapidly grew as, as we look at, at the Acts of the Apostles. 
This is just my personal journey, but I, I've come back to Acts of the Apostles over and over and over again, not because we want to go back into some past history, but to learn principles that are important for today. And so uh, this uh, spreading of the gospel began uh, in Jerusalem. In Acts 2 verse 17, the disciples are filled with the Spirit then in Acts 8 and verses 15 to 17, we find Samaritan converts. And let's just see where my notes are going to take us here. And uh, Acts 19 and verse 6 shows the Ephesians receive the Spirit. There's this movement from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, ends of the earth. And here are the five statements that you find going through the Acts of the Apostles that are kind of demarcation lines of growth and addition. First is in Acts 6 and verse 7. It says, So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. And then as the chapters move on, you find the second demarcation line in Acts 9 verse 31. Uh, the church just simply says, It grew in numbers. A lot of people are fearful when we talk numbers. God put a book called Numbers in the Old Testament. It's not too much of a problem because we've got to be able to measure growth. We've got to be able to see if we're succeeding and uh, if we're seeing any measure of success. In Acts 12, that's the next one, Acts 12 verse 24, but the word of God continued to increase and spread. Acts uh, 16 verse 5, so the churches were strengthened in the faith and grew daily in numbers. You know, I was brought up in, a, in a, an environment where we never saw new growth. You know, it would be a, a, a real thing if on occasion a visitor came. And I, I don't look back with any kind of judgments at all, but there was something in a number of us that said, this cannot be, because we need to see that which Jesus came for, we need to see people finding faith and coming to an awareness of his presence. There needs to be growth. And, uh, and I believe that you've got to practically measure that. And so it's a joy for me to be able to say to you that on Sunday we baptized 19 people. That's not to say, look how well we're doing, because it's it's, it's a, a tiny number, but there should be growth. There should be people coming to faith. We are experiencing, on a fairly regular basis, people um, coming into a meeting and saying, I woke up this morning with a deep desire to come to church. In the last month, that's happened on three occasions. So what does that tell us? Well, it tells us the Holy Spirit is working outside and is convicting people, challenging people. Some people are going to make their way into a building. Some people aren't. And that's why there needs to be a strategic movement in the church that welcomes people. And whenever people come, hospitality, there, uh, there, there are no meetings where we don't have any um, uh, visitors. It's part of how we need to uh, build, and yet we know that we're only going to reach a few by the come method. And that's why missional advancement is very important. And so just for a minute or two, and then I'll uh, conclude, let me come back to the whole issue of fresh expressions, which we as a network are very supportive of. I personally have not got too close, but uh, one of our team, Dr. Pete Atkins, has been right in the thick of this for a long period of time. Uh, just a little bit of a background and timeline that I would like to honor uh, goes back to something in 2004, Mission Shaped Church Report, I believe, was, was brought. And that led to the formation of the Fresh Expressions team with a man called Steve Croft originally, I believe, I think I've got my facts right, as Archbishop's missioner and first leader. But the reason I share this is because that came from an Anglican source, but we as a sort of a new church network said, look, we want to be a part of this. And we were involved in what was known at the time as a um, Humber to the Wash leadership training because we've had a vision to see, this, was, this has been our vision for nearly 40 years, to see a cell group in every village, congregation in every town, 
and a celebration of God's people in every city between the Humber and the Wash. That's where we began with a geographical sort of uh, thing. And so we had this training program that was a part of our ground level network. And so in 2006, ground level got involved through training and there came about, a, firstly, a mission-shaped leadership course which we then recognized leadership shouldn't just be leadership. It then became mission-shaped ministry where all could be involved. And some wonderful people began to help us there, Bob and Mary Hopkins from the Anglican Church Planting Initiatives, Graham Horsley, Methodist, and, uh, and Tim Robertson from Assemblies of God. And I was thrilled that, that just in the history of this, we were beginning to cross some denominational divides and work for missional advancement. And uh, so uh, that training... Uh, gave a broad spectrum of theology and churchmanship, um, and I believe it emerged in part from the in part from the charismatic end of the church. Pete Atkins, my friend's opinion is that MSM, Mission Shape uh, Ministry, delivery and application was best delivered with openness to the gifts of the Spirit. He asked if I could put that in, because I think it's very important. Fresh Expressions team was subsequently led from 2009 and then 2014 by Anglican charismatic leaders Graham Cray and Phil Potter. And I think it's been made, uh, the comment has been made that that charismatic move, I think, has influenced some of this fresh expression thinking that we're enjoying today. Um, and just four little concepts that uh, I think are important as we just connect what I, my little history together with fresh expressions. Four things I think have been important to fresh expressions. The first is this thing called the mission of God. <laughs> and the mission of God which requires us to discern what God is doing and join in. And uh, I believe the charismatic gifts really are important in that, especially prophetic, knowing what God is doing, what, what is God saying. The second thing is the mixed economy. We've heard about that, which I'm pretty passionate about, which is honoring the traditional as well as developing the new in partnership together. And I believe that there should be a, a great emphasis on unity and partnership. We have this little phrase, partnership without ownership, where we're together on mission for purpose. Thirdly, the importance of context. When developing a fresh expression of church, the emphasis of charismatics on hearing God, the gift of discernment, the leading of the Holy Spirit are all keys to this. What's the context? Do we need to go into a different people's group or a specific area? What is the Spirit saying? And then fourthly, the concept of going to those who need Jesus. We need to form church often where people are and we need to allow the Holy Spirit to blow us in directions that we had not planned. And so I'm thrilled to be able to endorse on this special lecture day, fresh expressions, and may God bless everything that you are doing. And so I conclude with future movement, future movement. Where are things going? Well, I've just got three simple things that I think are vitally important. The first is uh, that unity is essential. Back to Psalm 133, how wonderful it is when brothers and sisters dwell together in unity. I don't believe that's ecumenical niceness. I believe it's a passion to see the gospel uh, reaching our nation again. It's very interesting today that as I perhaps caused some problems historically with existing situations, I had a very interesting phone call uh, just over three years ago. A man called Nicky Gumbel, you, many of you have heard that name, phoned me and said, uh, we're thinking of planting in Lincoln. How do you feel about that? So, uh, and I thought that was very gracious. And so I said, uh, I said he then said to me, I'm not even... Um, sure exactly where the building is. The bishop has been in touch. It's a place called St. Swithin's in Lincoln. And I said, I'm in my office now and I'm looking at St. Swithin's. It's three minutes up the road. So he said, well, perhaps we ought not to, you know, when we, we're rumming and are in. And, and I found myself saying, no, uh, you need to plant into Lincoln. We need more churches in Lincoln. And I said, what's more, and then you engage your brain a little bit later, but I said, what's more, we'll send some of our key leaders to help you plant. And so we sent three couples 
to help them plant. But what I've found is this, that when new things happen and you start to lose one or two of your people, you start to, if you're not careful, become defensiveness. And I was realizing that what people were feeling 40 years ago with what I did, I'm now feeling as others are starting fresh expressions and I need the grace of God uh, to be able to recognize that. Unity is essential. Secondly, I passionately believe this. Everything we do from start to finish should be Jesus-centered. It's for his glory. It's for his namesake. It's for his honor. And uh, thirdly, I believe that the future must hold more fresh expressions, whatever we call them. I've, n I've never been in the world where I've used that, those words too much. I still talk about church planting. I still talk, talk about old, old language sometimes. But I genuinely believe that we need more communities of faith, particularly across rural areas, where more people have access to hear the gospel. But also, they become prayer centers and sending bases. And I still believe in uh, where I began 40 years ago, in apostles, prophets, evangelists, and pastors, and teachers, equipping the saints, which is all of the people, for the work of the ministry, which isn't just church stuff. It's out into the world. Thank you so much. Um, so from uh, a link from uh, Samuel uh, to Stuart via me. Um, a bit tenuous, but um, uh, I was brought up in a council house on the edge of the wonderful and notorious Beckentree estate. Uh, that some of you will know about. And our house was different to most of the houses around because we had a bookcase in our house. We had a bookcase because my grandparents had been converted in the early Pentecostal revivals. My mum had been brought up into, in that environment and had married my dad, who at 14 years old, was a black marketeer uh, with a tie lever strapped to his wrist and a big knife in his pocket. I can point you to his testimony that uh, he uh, gave uh, in his last years. I got a chance to interview him in detail and did it sort of just in time. But um, one of the books, which I'm sure was bought from a second-hand bookshop, was The Way to Pentecost by Samuel Chadwick. And... Uh, I asked who this was because it was a book that wasn't about a missionary and didn't have pictures in, and so I wasn't that much interested in it. And they said that um, Samuel Chadwick was a Methodist and he was almost a Pentecostal, um, which isn't surprising if you read um, about Chadwick's doctrine of subsequence um, the need for a dramatic infilling of the Spirit. Uh, he was almost a Pentecostal because um, in an Assemblies of God family, there was no evidence of initial evidence, which, as you know, is still at least, according to fundamental truths, um, quite important. So that was my link into Chadwick. And then, um, when I was in my early 20s, um, I was involved in a theatre group which became a church, uh, which by any standards I think would be an example of pioneering ministry. What happened? We did theatre, um, pretty grim acting, but we did theatre anyway. And just like Stuart's story of finding all sorts of places that opened up to us in a way that our local congregations didn't, we got involved there and realized that something was happening that meant we were rewilding the church. And I'll come to the, back to that trope in just a moment or two. Initially, my mum and dad were very skeptical about what my wife and I were doing. Um, I was the oldest person in the church at uh, 22, 23, I think. Uh, but gradually, they came and joined us. And one of the key things was because they had heard of this guy who was slightly younger than me, 
Uh, he, one of the things I did disagree with him, he actually put the 60s as 40 years ago. You're doing what I do, mate, and getting stuck. Um, yeah, nearly 60 years ago. Yeah, um, but the 60s, 70s were a long, long time ago. Um, but they heard about this guy, uh, Stuart Bell, who was gaining huge credibility in their mind because he was working with the two Johns in Lincoln, John Phillips and John Shelburne. Now, you can get a quick summary of uh, uh, Stuart's story if you read a book by William Kay called Apostolic Networks in Britain. And it's well worth reading. It's a book that I refer to very often and have needed to do so in uh, doing masters and doctoral work. But um, it was very evident that for my parents, there were certain things that were going to be really important. And the fact that there was this Irenic connection, married to an Irene as well, so interesting use of the word there, I guess, um, between the Assemblies of God and the New Church movement that uh, uh, was there, uh, in Stuart's life was extremely helpful to me. I don't think I heard Stuart speak until the 80s. And more recently, because we uh, some time ago started planting church in a semi-rural area uh, in the northern part of Wiltshire, um, we decided we needed some other reference point. We made a link with Pete Atkins. Pete... Um, works in uh, northern Lincolnshire, I suppose it really is. No, is it north or south? Yeah, in the mid-Lincolnshire. And uh, is modelling some very interesting kind of uh, church work that uh, initially appeared in um, Mission Shaped and Rural, the, the Sally Gay's book, and has subsequently uh, come on from there. And for the last three years, um, Pete and Kath have spent a weekend with us in our church um, and uh, have been a useful source and of advice and help and challenge, something that we look forward to in our planning uh, for something which has got more of a Wiltshire focus for next year. So that's, that's the link there. But now um, to try and pick up from uh, Joe's session this morning uh, and then to tie it into the afternoon. The, um, I really appreciated what Jo had to say because, apart from anything else, she had a whole list of books which I've ignored. One of the characteristics of doing a PhD is that you become totally dumb and thick as far as currents outside of your own is concerned. You just read and read and read in your own field. And as she was talking, I was actually on the Amazon website ordering books uh, on my church credit card, I think, on this occasion, um, and trying to think, oh, I've got to catch up on reading that and on that and on that. And there were some things that I thought I wish I'd known about those beforehand. But I wanted to pick up two um, theological links just briefly here. Uh, the first is that from Kirstine Kim, who I think, Joe, you have pointed out, was talking about the Spirit's work outside sacred walls. Um, I think that's a hugely important developmental area. She's drawn from, uh, there are other people who are working in this area. Uh, John Levison, who's been writing for ages and has challenged uh, Pentecostals to think hard about whether the Spirit can do anything outside of the local congregation. Um, uh, Robert Johnston, evangelical at Fuller, has talked about God's wider presence. Mark Cartledge has talked about encountering God in the mundane as well as the dramatic. Um, so there are a number of, uh, number of points of connection with the charismatic and with uh, fresh expressions and encounter with God um, outside of sacred walls. So that's been uh, one thing that I wanted to mention. It, it relates to the whole area of um, uh, divine concursus as well. Um, 
And then I'm a bit of a disciple of Amos Young who can get you in trouble very quickly because he keeps on pushing out into one direction or another and then suddenly retreats, leaving you somewhat exposed. But within the mission of God, he's talked about the mission of the Spirit, Missio Spiritus. And uh, if you can uh, accept that the missions of the Son and the Spirit are somewhat independent and somewhat interrelated and that the Spirit isn't always dependent on the Son's uh, work. You see, uh, we always think about the fact that uh, it was necessary for Jesus to go, for the Spirit to come. Good Pentecostal stuff, uh, uh, good evangelical thinking there. But if the Spirit hadn't have come first, there would have been no Jesus. There would have been no Christmas. The Spirit of God overshadowed Mary. And out of that, out of the primacy of the Spirit, came the Son of God on earth. Interesting theme there. So that leads to, um, on to thinking about what um, Stuart had to say. There are some other things I want to mention. The mystical, uh, the, uh, the fair point that um, Joe made about the pneumatological, imp at least this is why I wrote it down, you may not have said this, about the uh, pneumatological imperative sometimes being seen as centrifugal. Um, I think that's a fair point there. I want to say something about spiritual accompaniment. Uh, I also want to come back to the issue of lay, lay. Uh, which to a new church person sounds very strange indeed because that's where we started from and we're still lay lay. Stuart uh, is still a lay person in that sense. Doug Gay, um, uh, some time ago, I think he's still at Glasgow University, said that he'd got such a low view of ordination that you couldn't limbo under it. And I think that's probably uh, where most of us within the, uh, the new churches certainly would exist. Um, so, uh, our purpose, the purpose of the Spirit in our lives is to manifest the active presence of God. The, uh, Kirsten Kim says, the Spirit introduces us to Jesus who shows us the Father. Now, that's a slightly different way of thinking about the work of the Spirit. And I appreciated that Stuart painted the picture that broadly. My one story from my research. Um, the people I talked to, I asked the question, just said to them at the beginning, tell me, all that you can about how you became a Christian, all the events and experiences that are important to you. It's a method which is designed to get away from testimony. It is a method which is used in medical research, in social research, has never, as far as I know, been used in conversion research up to now. And one lady told me a story that was somewhat like this. By the way, I talked to people between the ages of 20 and 40. Half of them were younger than 40. Half of them were 40 and over. This particular lady had experienced a bereavement. She was married. She'd got teenage children. Her father had been a fleet air arm pilot, obviously a pretty important hero. She had been terribly bereft. And at one point had approached a spiritualist medium uh, to get some consolation. One day, she, when she was uh, about six months after he died, she was walking along on her own, probably with the dogs, and uh, uh, suddenly from nowhere, a cloud of butterflies, as she described it, came and landed on her. Her impression at that time was that this was the presence of her father returning to be with her. Bit uncomfortable about that idea. You see, she got this butterfly that had been in his study. She had it in her room. Uh, but that helped her. 
Another six months later, she and her husband were on holiday, I think in Mallorca. Uh, he's the director of a fairly large company. And as husbands sometimes do when they're on holiday, he got a call from work and uh, walked away while they were visiting uh, a monastery somewhere. And there was one of those uh, Christ the Redeemer statues, you know, with the arms outstretched. And as she stood there, butterflies began to come and land on this statue. And she read on the bottom, my arms are open for you. And like I found sometimes in my research, people who had started off thinking the comforting presence was that of a dead relative, this particular woman began to associate that comfort with the Holy Spirit of God. The upshot of it was this. Over the next six months, she started watching God TV. From watching God TV, she um, decided that she would find a church, and she would find a church that had... Uh, that she knew previous neighbours of theirs had been members of and turned up in a standard, charismatic, inherited church. Sung worship, preaching, altar call ministry time. As well as that, they had somebody who painted pictures during the service. And it was in that inherited, charismatic environment that she found spiritual accompanies, people who would walk through her journey with her. And in my research, that was a much more common feature than the crisis conversion. It was even more common than the route through Alpha, although in some cases that happened as well. So with you there, the active presence of God personal experience leading to wider mission, personal experience as an alternative to wider mission. Sometimes I think for those of us who were involved in Toronto around 1994, it threw us off course, um, maybe and maybe not. Um, Bevans and Schroeder, Bevans and Ross, writing on prophetic dialogue. I think... Uh, I think Bevins and Schroeder missed it a bit because they talk about prophetic dialogue without ever talking about the gifts of the Spirit being involved. How you can manage to get through using Thessalonians as your model for prophetic dialogue without talking about the gifts of the Spirit, um, particularly uh, is, is something that uh, surprises me. But... On many cases that, that I have come across, there is evidence of these charismatic gifts coming into play. Lots of you will have listened to Johnny Baker or read Johnny Baker talking about uh, the use of the Jesus pack of cards in mind, body, spirit fairs. And uh, there is no doubt about the fact that the framing of prophetic gifts is possibly just as much outside of our congregations as it is within. Gosh, I'll just take one more and then I must uh, pose some questions, um, which perhaps would be a bit sharper from me coming from within side, uh, from inside uh, the new churches to uh, Stuart, and you may want to develop them. Um, I've already mentioned about the notion of fresh expressions and uh, the lay-lay uh, factors. Um, I do think there are some issues there. Um, I speak as somebody who has a son who is an Anglican pioneer. I appreciated what you said about pressure coming from the uh, church um, structures, and he's certainly experienced that. Um, but if you are ministering on a sink estate, 
he's also found that pressure has come from local politicians who don't like the idea that there is some other locus of people who have a concern for the population in those places and are not prepared to count out party politics in order to uh, uh, find a way forward. Um, and I've, uh, I've been called a rebel by some well-known names in the past, and there is no doubt about it that some of those things do leave their mark. And as a charismatic, I would want to question sometimes whether those things have the implication of what we would consider to be curses that actually can mark us for a long, long time. And whether the therapy comes through prayer ministry or through other means, um, there may be an issue there. But here are my questions. Here are my questions. And I think these come out of my research. I'm running out of time, so I'll read these. Church planters, not only Pentecostal charismatic church planters, but FX church planters as well, are often unable to identify those who have been converted rather than those who have transferred to their churches or experienced a revitalized Christianity. Claire Dauper and John Vivian did uh, some sterling work in the Anglican context to try and come up with definitions that would fit this. And uh, Kathy Ross and her oppo, David Dadswell, uh, actually found that when they were talking to church planters in London, very, very few church planters could actually say how many people had been converted. Now, that had already been evident at some points in Mission Shaped Church as well. So here's my question. Stuart, why is it that we all struggle with, uh, or appear to struggle, with being able to identify those who are converts coming into our churches? So that's uh, one of my questions. My second is about this term missional. Now, in some context, the word missional is used as a synonym for evangelistic. Um, in some contexts, missional is used as a synonym for anything not evangelistic, and it's designed to exclude evangelism uh, from a Christian mission. It can go either way. Um, Stuart, where and how do you discern the work of the Spirit in other spheres than that of the congregation? I'm pretty certain Stuart's got a good answer to this because just yesterday I made a point of listening to a, um, uh, an audio recording of one of the ground level conferences because I've never had chance to uh, listen to that stuff before and was interested about the wide range of activities that uh, his churches were involved in. And my third question is this. From the beginning, um, Pentecostal and charismatic churches have shown interest in fresh expressions. If, in, if, like me, one of your requirements from your supervisor was to learn mission-shaped church off by heart, um, or at least, even if you didn't ask it, I uh, have uh, done so over a large number of years, you will know that one of the things that Cray pointed out there was that post-denominational networks, by which he was thinking of things like Soul Survivor, New Wine, St. Thomas's, um, have right from the beginning shown interest in fresh expressions. Ground level has been unique in actually putting somebody into the National Fresh Expressions team pretty much from the beginning, who's still been there now. Undoubtedly, though, most Pentecostal and charismatic church planting is proceeding on a franchise model, on a church cloning model where essentially what you do 
is your goal is to reproduce the same kind of Sunday morning meeting that has occurred previously. George Lings and Stuart Murray Williams have critiqued that um, about 10 years ago, much more recently and much more sharply, Michael Moyner in Church in Life has talked about that as well. So, um, I think that's probably it. Um, yeah, in fact, inherited charismatic church with small groups, worship service, sung preaching, sung worship, preaching, altar call, seems as strong as ever as a model for church planting. Is there a basis for the confidence in this form of meeting, this model of meeting as the appropriate means of making disciples of those with little or no church background? Do you see signs of things changing? So you may want to add to those questions, but those were mine. Um, what about, why can't we count properly? Um, secondly, about the work of the Spirit outside of the congregation and finally, um, the issue of um, uh, fresh expressions in inherited. Uh, I would say possibly the counting properly is to do with insecurity, basically. But um, it's a thing actually we're working on quite hard. And in a, a growing situation, I think there need to be certain mechanisms to help with that. So we've got a thing known as the growth track. We, we used to have things like um, um, membership courses that would run twice, three times a year or whatever. But what we're doing now is if we have a contact on a Sunday, within, within two weeks they will start on a journey. And that journey will be um, watched and noted and helped through, discipled through. So uh, what we do now, and we've not done it for that long, um, but we are in a position, certainly in uh, the Lincoln scene, we are in a position, if you were to come and ask us questions, we would be able to answer most of those things for the last three years or so. Um, the, the problem we used to work on was you get lots of front door activity and then you'd suddenly think that we're not growing that much, so more you know, people are not staying. So this growth track allows us to with relatively small groups of people to um, share the fundamental things of uh, what it means to belong to the community, to belong to the church. and But it gives us uh, opportunity for c connecting them to play. We, we're great believers in small groups still in ho the home, so we have connect groups where we connect uh, people. But then we track, we track them. Uh, just through personal relational connections and I think we're getting better at it when we're, we're not uh, you know when we're, we're not where we would like to be but the thing that I do want us to address more and more is church transfer stuff because you know if you're not careful the the new the new thing the bigger experience these days can pull people and I think because the days when a pastor had you know a church that looked to him listened to him there are 101 things we can people we can be listening to podcasts and watching the best of communicators and whatever and and loyalty to a commit and a commitment to a group is a lot more difficult these days um but what we don't want to do is just shift the furniture on Titanic you know and um and so uh, we're, we're quite big on that. So we would want protocols between churches. We're working on that. Protocols whereby if someone from another church visits, you don't, you know, welcome, well, you welcome them, but you don't, you know, you, you, you actually uh, make the connection with the church they've left and so on. We're quite big on that, actually. Uh, uh, I'll just answer it briefly and then we can go. The second area about the out outside of the church, again, this is a relatively new thing with us. I would have to say when we first began, church was it. It was like, can there be a new kind of church? Didn't think much beyond the walls. Um, you know, what are we? It, it was a survival mode that, that we had. And then, then we were... Uh, wanting to create different cultures of church so that church could be welcoming, empowering, 
from our point of view, biblical and tra training people to, to live their lives well, if you like. But as time has gone on, we've recognized that actually the, the, the full picture of, of, of our churches should be the empowering of people to live out that Christian experience, obviously beyond the walls, and we only have our people with us a relatively period of time. Most of the time they're out in the homes, families, um, many broken things out there and, and jobs and so on. So um, certainly with ground level, we've got four strategic objectives for the next few years. The first is children and youth. So unless we really um, work hard on you know, children and youth, we're going to miss it. Um, the other is leadership training, because I think training uh, is, is very important, the kind of leaders that empower. And, and, um, and then a, a third one is what we call influence. The, the fourth is reproducing churches, that everything we do should reproduce. And uh, we, we had a whole year last year with the word multiply almost in everything. So the aim being that um, the message, it's like seed being sown all over the place and uh, that every one of us are involved in, in the, the sharing of the, of the faith and that that should produce uh, multiplication. Uh, where we're at at the moment, we have a thing attached to ground level called GLX, which is ground level exchange, where what we do is we, we bring people from all different spheres of society. Some, some call it the, you know, the seven mountains, the, the different spheres of society covering you know, things like education, health, and, uh, and business world, and so on. And what we do is we, uh, from across our network, instead of it being leaders gathered, though we want sort of church leaders there, but we gather teachers and you know, people involved in ed education, business, health, et cetera. And then we get some key missional people that are not church uh, people, but are working in uh, and being productive, if you like, in their faith in other spheres of society. Um, and so we're giving far more attention now to the outside, the church. And uh, there's some great things there. I mean, for instance, just one little story, but a Nigerian uh, guy spoke at one of these events and was talking about, um, you know, the gifts of the spirit in the workplace. And, you know, so often we'd confine gifts to within church context, but he t just told a very wonderful story. He was a, in a high level of um, putting together, um, sorry, coding for, it was, it's some years ago that this story came from, but coding software materials. And uh, it was um, at quite a high level and he needed to produce something that was working and he couldn't make it work. The code was not working for him. And um, his Nigerian background, prayer was vital. So he came to the prayer meeting at night and he's thinking, did I ought to keep working to get this deadline met or shall I pray? And then he tried to connect the two worlds and says, well, I need some help. So he went to the prayer meeting and it was while he was in the prayer meeting and people were praying for him because he'd, he'd done all that he knew how to get this thing working. And um, in prayer, he suddenly saw a couple of numbers. And, um, and when he went back, he put the code together and everything worked. Now, it's a bit dramatic, but it was like he, he would attribute a word of knowledge was given to him sovereignly that allowed him to work in that context. And that's a dramatic sort of picture, but I think what we're saying is um, we want all of us equipped so that we can in life and word and sharing be the best we possibly can in, in the world, if you like, uh, sharing the faith. But, but more than that, I think, becoming influencers. We've got a great little personal story on this of our own son. Andrew's our eldest son, and he came to me some time ago and said, Dad, I love what you're doing. I want to serve God, but I don't want to do what you're doing. So I said, good call. And, uh, but he said, I, I love teaching. And he's a primary school teacher. And we were doing a little series on Daniel at the time, and there's a little verse there that says, 
um, you know, Daniel and his contemporaries were ten times better than those that the magicians and those that were around. And we were because it was one of our Bible studies at the time. I said to Andrew, "Well, actually, you're influencing far more people than I can ever because you know you've got all these children year after year that you're teaching. You're influencing by how you do that, how you live. You don't have to be preaching and getting your Bible out, but." Why don't we agree that you become 10 times better than your contemporaries? It's a long story, but actually he, um, out of the blue this came, he became teacher of the year nationally for, um, for primary school teachers. Now, I believe that was just a God thing, a, a moment where the security he felt with that in a sense, just that little accolade and honor, which was totally unexpected that he would attribute to, I want to be the best I can for God. And so things like that, equipping people so that they don't think, you know, they have to have a microphone and a platform to follow God. And um, so GLX is our attempt to do that. And what happens is the exchange of ideas and then people connect with one another. And so people in education from different uh, churches connect and pray together. Whole batch of people within the health department, they, they meet together, pray together, help one another. It's just a little attempt, really, to make that shift. Um, your third thing on fresh expressions, um, why are we still there? One of the, one of the principles I um, really feel is a motivation for my life is long-term thinking. I don't like starting a thing and then trying something else in one sense. I, I, I like to, um, if I start a thing, I want to see a thing through. And I think the problem is that with a lot of initiatives that have come, and let's face it, through, through the years, in, we've had all kinds of campaigns, gym campaigns years ago, and uh, uh, all, all kinds of campaigns to G up the church. And uh, I've always felt if we're going to give ourselves to something, Let's, um, let's be there for it. Um, that, that's been important. And then the challenge, the, your fourth challenge is, I think is a great challenge because it's, it's a thing that I'm challenged by. Um, are we going to just keep doing what we're doing in the way that we're doing it? It's, um, you know, we, we in new churches said, you know, we're not into liturgy, but we've got strong liturgy, haven't we? And we do things the same and all the rest. Interestingly, a lot out of the new church movement have moved one way or the other, <laughs> if you like. Some have, have moved way away from new church. They've deconstructed, their, their, you know, some of them have shifted ground, uh, and, and others have gone into more traditional denominational settings again. What I do know, and this is big, and it, it's a number of us feel, that that which we perhaps uh, let, let go of years ago because we felt it was overly religious and uh, there was no life in it. I think we're rediscovering some of those things again. So a, a lot of our friends are perhaps uh, using liturgical prayer um, on a daily basis. Uh, we're thinking more seriously about sacramental issues. Uh, this, is, this is right at, at this moment. We're talking a lot more about how our breaking of bread is, is, is not what, what I think it, it ought to be for various reasons that I can't go into. But we started to react against certain things. Shall I say 50 years ago now? Then? <laughs> we started to react against things uh, because they seem to have got into a rut or a routine and stuff. Yet those things that are alive in the spirit, you know, and one of the problems with new church people, they, they became elitist, I think, and, um, you know, we've got it, you don't have it. And what I feel, I, I genuinely feel this, we've been overtaken in the new church movement by people that we thought wouldn't make it through. And um, some of the denominational churches, I would say, have become the apostolic centers that we were looking to build. So... I don't know whether that answers at all, but I do think uh, a number of our new churches now are not just having the opportunity for the for the usual, you know, we s 
slum worship, you, you, you described it well, apart from you missed the offering, but that was pretty much it. <laughs>